Hey, what's up guys? Jace Two Cents here bringing you a talking head about a subject that I think is on, on a lot of people's minds right now. The title might be a little sensationalized, maybe, maybe not, but uh, I want to talk about the idea of buying the best product or the best tier doesn't mean it's the best for you. And it's easy to get caught up in that mind trap and then start wasting money and stuff. Like the money we're about to waste, completely redoing the offices and stuff in this warehouse. Kioxia is proud to celebrate their 35th anniversary of the company's invention of NAND Flash, a technology that has changed how we work and play. The XT6 Enterprise Data Center NVMe SSDs feature Kioxia's developed controller, firmware in its own 3D flash memory by CS Flash, and feature a new set of form factors for future server and data center support with easy hot swappability. To see the complete spec sheet of all of Kioxia's developed drives and to celebrate the 35th anniversary, follow the link in the description below. So also too, a little shout out to the fact that August 6th, if you guys remember I talked about we're gonna be doing the pop-up garage sale, August 6th in Fullerton, California, is when we're gonna be doing that. I'll be giving uh, further details closer to the event, so stay tuned for that. If you guys are in the Southern California area, you're gonna be passing through, or heck, you just wanna fly in for whatever, we're gonna have a lot of stuff for sale for some pretty crazy garage sale type prices because I wanna, I wanna kinda pay that forward as much as possible as we're trying to clear out space in here. So, mark your calendars, August 6th in Fullerton, California. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about the topic today, which is the, the mindset of buying the, the highest end product that exists. So what I'm talking about here obviously applies to motherboards, CPUs, memory, graphics cards, power supplies. Um, I think the only thing it truly doesn't apply to is gonna be potentially coolers and cases. And the reason for that is those can expand and grow with you. But let's talk about uh, CPUs first of all. This is more confusing now for a lot of people than we've had in say the last decade because of the fact that there are more SKUs than there's ever been. Prior to Ryzen having its rise to success, um, you had some FX processors, right? You had an eight core, two of them. You had a six core, two of them. And you had a four core, uh, 4300 and 4100s. Yeah, two of them, and then moving up from there. Intel had its i3, i5, i7, and that was kind of it. It was simple, it was easy, life was simple. Oh, you want a game? i5 is perfect. Oh, you want to do some productivity in gaming? i7, call it a day. You didn't even have all these different i7 SKUs and such. Now you've got i9 to deal with on that. And you've got Ryzen 3, which is kind of gone now, but you had Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7, Ryzen 9. Obviously, I don't know who's copying who in terms of the numbering, probably AMD versus Intel, or copying Intel, because Intel had the numbering first, but I digress, that's just a fanboy statement. CPUs now have expanded, like width-wise, in terms of core count, a ton in the last 10 years. But with that has become complexities in the process and the architecture to make that happen. So for instance, on Ryzen, you have the Infinity Fabric. And when that first came out, we saw improved, uh, increased latency between which chiplets were being accessed by whatever program by it having to communicate the memory through the Infinity Fabric that connects the, or the interconnect for the chiplets. So Right off the bat, when we started having like the 3950X and the like 12 core CPUs and 16 core CPUs now, 32 threads, those were having to use an interconnect to communicate because they realistically were scalable chiplets that they added more to the substrate to get more core counts in those CPUs. So the problem is adding, when it comes to gaming, adding those chiplets and that interconnect increased a decent amount of latency. Maybe not necessarily perceived by your eye. Definitely perceived in benchmarks, <clears throat> definitely perceived in latency tests. So what that means is, although that would be the best CPU on that platform, being AMD's mainstream desktop platform, not Threadripper, and this obviously applies to Threadripper too, it wasn't the best CPU when it came to gaming being the main purpose of the build because of the fact that you were actually reducing your maximum FPS and creating latency bottlenecks in your system by having an overspec CPU that wasn't necessarily meant to do the job. It's like, you can take a Freightliner and tow a tiny U-Haul trailer, but it doesn't make sense, right? Because you can tow that same trailer with a regular pickup truck, or a Honda, even. So, balancing your system out in that way, it's, it's easy to, to start blasting and wasting money in areas that you don't need it. So, for gaming CPUs, the highest core count is not always the best. Now yes, there are outliers. There are games that absolutely will leverage as many cores as possible. It's not about the maximum FPS. It's not even about, it's not even a fast movement game. Like if it's a top down strategy type, like Civilization. Civilization is a game that takes a lot of CPU, or at least I've heard. I haven't played Civilization, but this is the argument I've always heard from people. And I think Linus was actually a huge Civilization fan, but it doesn't matter. You, you deal with these large worlds 
that's a lot of CPU bound bottlenecking that the, the game is having to deal with. Whereas some of the after effects and some of the you know, post-processing and all that handled by the GPU, you don't need a super high-end GPU to make that work. And that only makes sense to spec your CPU high for that situation if that's literally the only game you play. But there's still a lot of balancing that you can do there. So for instance, if you were looking at just building a gaming system, the 5800X3D would completely obliterate the 5950X in terms of gaming, and that's just because of the improved V-cache that exists on the 5800X3D. Now, in terms of cost, it is cheaper than the 5950X, but if cost was still a, an ex, an, a very important you know, thought to you at the time when you're building your system, it probably wouldn't make sense to go with a $600 CPU anyway, like the 5800X3D. The standard 5800X in the $300 price range is gonna make way more sense. And then again, the high performance difference is gonna be negligible if you're not running a super high-end graphics card, which needs that uplift of V-cache to be able to give you the maximum FPS. So. Let's look at the inverse of that. If you were to go out and get yourself a, a 6900 XT or a 6950 XT, and you went out and got, or got yourself a 3090 Ti, and then you pair that with like, oh, I don't know, let's just say a uh, Ryzen 3300. That's not gonna make a whole lot of sense because of the fact that you know that 3300, it's limited core count, it's limited clock speed, it's limited cache, is going to do nothing but bottleneck the max performance of the 3090 Ti. Does that mean you'll have terrible performance? No, it means you'll have performance left on the table that you paid for with that system, that you, or that graphics card, that you're never gonna see in that particular system. So balancing is very important. And I know we've talked about this in previous videos where it sounds very similar to with me saying, it's easy to waste money here. But what I didn't talk about in that video specifically was the fact that the best or highest tier product is not always the best for you. Even if you have the money and you're like, I wanna build, look, if I were to go right now, build a system in any cart, like our, our PC builder simulator, not simulator, but a like part picker thing. And I was just to sort by highest price first and put the top of each one of those items in there, that would be one of the most powerful yet unbalanced and non-streamlined systems you could possibly build. I'd probably end up having like 128 gigs of RAM. I'd probably end up having like a 1600 watt PSU, a single 3090 Ti or 6950 XT, depending on the titles, those trade blows on who's faster. I'd end up having like a Threadripper 2990 WX, or 3990 WX these days, I guess. I'd have some $2,000 motherboard, right? And I would have like a, some off the wall, crazy, super expensive box to put it all in, AKA a case. That system right there would absolutely be blown away by a properly balanced system designed to play games. Now, if you're sitting here doing CAD design, or you are literally rendering, rendering out 3D animation, the most amount of RAM that you can get, the most amount of VRAM that you can get, and the fastest CPU that you can get makes sense, if that's your use case. So I think it's hard for a lot of people not to get caught up in overspending and just buying the best, but not the best product for them. I think one of the things I've had to really, in the last 10 years I've been, I've been doing this channel, to have to sort of reprogram myself is going, I need to have the highest end Halo SKU a product, a product available by any company. I need to have the highest end graphics card. I need to have the highest end CPU. I need the highest of everything. The problem with that is often, more often than not, I find myself dominating benchmarks because benchmarks are optimized to take advantage of that kind of hardware, but my real world gaming situations have never been as good as they could possibly be. I've, had, I've dealt with tons of micro stutter in the past because I was, I was so hell bent on running three-way SLI when it was still supported that I found myself constantly having to have profiles set so it would turn on in certain titles and to not turn on in other titles because certain titles were optimized and others weren't. Or was it implicit SLI or was it explicit SLI? You know, there were so many complications to that that once Nvidia dropped SLI altogether, I was sad that I lost the like wow slash cool factor of seeing, you know, a stack of three Titan Maxwell graphics cards. Titan X Maxwell was one of my favorite periods because that was around the pinnacle of when SLI was really scaling well before it started to decline with Pascal and go down. It caused me more problems than you would imagine. 
I had multiple panels set up because I went, big surround panels is the best. Do you know how many times I'd come in and turn on my system and then the order of the panels just rearrange themselves for God knows why, because Nvidia's SLI manager when it came to, to outputs, because they had to be plugged into a very specific order on the cards. And if you plug one panel into each card, that gets you a different type of NV surround than say having them all plugged into one card. I mean, it, and then once you included something like G-Sync and whatnot in there, it got even more convoluted. Like I had so many panel problems and frustrations, it wasn't even funny. You can go back and go to some of my, my earliest Instagrams and heck, even um, the cached uh, Vine. I have Vines up there of me like sitting there in front of my system and the screens will turn on and that one will turn off and then they'll turn off and that'll turn on and it'll be a different order. I'm just sitting there going, okay, Nvidia, what the hell, man? It's just doing it on its own. So as you can see, the coolest, best situation there was obviously not the, the best use case and the, the best experience. Memory is another one. People get very caught up in over-specking. My followers range from beginners that have never built a PC to like full-on 30-year experience, network admin, DB administrators, programmers, very, very respected professionals in their fields. There, but my point is there's very few people that actually need 128 gigabytes of RAM or more. I mean, if you're a developer and you've got VM machine, VM systems uh, or installs all over your rig because you're testing various things or you're running servers and stuff, that's about the only situation I could see that much RAM being that important. Because even if you're a CAD designer, these days you're probably running the graphics card that has the most amount of VRAM possible at the fastest amount of VRAM possible and you're offloading it all on there. So you're either using like a, a 3090 Ti, potentially 3090, maybe you're still using a Titan V, uh, you're probably running a Quattro or something like that, you, or, or even a Fire Pro that they have over on AMD side. You're probably not running desktop slash gaming hardware to make any of this work, unless you're trying to make one system work for you in that use case. It's very easy to accidentally overspec. I mean, right now in 2022, July of 2022, the day we're recording this, it's no one really needs anything more than a 5800X3D slash 20, uh, 12700K or even 11700K, 16 gigabytes of RAM. A lot of people argue now 32 is, is the new spec. If you're running DDR5, that's a minimum that you can get anyway is 32 gigs. But 16 gigabytes is still more than enough to get people by if you're not like live streaming and doing a bunch of other background tasks. Um, you know, an 850 watt power, uh, gold rated power supply, um, standard like 240 to 360 AIO or heck even just a Noctua slash be quiet slash whatever tower cooler. And you can call it a day with a 3070 Ti equivalent, 6800 XT. And the reason why I even mention those is because they're gonna last longer in the future as one of the things we've seen in history is that titles become more demanding with VRAM uh, cache. Obviously, um, they start to leverage the technologies available to them. So if they start leaning on tensor cores and RT cores or RT accelerators and AMD, then you'll find the cards that barely have any of those in there just for marketing purposes to be able to say they have it like a 3050. No one should ever have ray tracing turned on with a 3050. That makes no sense at all. Um, they'll last you longer. Otherwise, you can easily get two, three years out of a 50 slash 60 series card, and then you can go on like a three year upgrade cycle. I know I'm the guy that is known to overspec, overbuild systems all the time, but I'm caught in that conundrum of the audience almost expects it, but then at the same time, I think they expect it just so that they can kind of rip it apart. But you know, we build computers around here and it's just like, if you build cars for a living, every, every now and then you want to build some crazy project just simply because you have access to it, you have the tools and you have the tech and you're going to make it happen. It's like the $6 million PC instead of the $6 million man. Although I think now they call it the $6 billion man because of inflation. But anyway, that's kind of it. I just wanted to kind of get these brain thoughts out into your guys' screens so that I can maybe keep someone as we're getting ready to have new hardware, new CPUs, new graphics cards come out. Um, not go out there and just completely blow your wad unnecessarily and then you have buyer's remorse later. But anyway, speaking of buyer's remorse, I hope I don't have it when it comes to the project we're about to overtake because this is the absolute last video we are ever gonna shoot in this space because it is time to tear it all down because next week starts the expansion project of our studio. So anyway, thanks for watching guys and as always, We'll see you in the next one. And I hope you like construction vlogs because that's what we're dealing with now. <laughs>